Okay, uh, good evening everyone. My name is Randy Sabato and I'm a member of the Welcome Remembrance Planning Committee. I want to welcome you to tonight's event. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, I want to just give a couple of housekeeping announcements. Uh, wearing a mask is not mandatory, but recommended. Um, the, uh, please turn off your cell phones. Uh, the restrooms are located to the left of me, your, your right. Um, okay, so this month, uh, well, the month of May, which is actually tomorrow, begins the month-long celebration of Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Uh, for those of you who have, who have not had the opportunity to see the Remembering 1882 exhibit, which is in the PG Museum of Natural History, located just a block that way, uh, we invite you to go over there for the next couple of weeks to check it out. This is a traveling exhibit about the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, developed by the Chinese Historical Society and Museum in San Francisco. Um, so now, it is my distinct honor to introduce Dr. Russell Jung, who is, the, who is a professor of Asian American Studies at San Francisco State University. Dr. Jung is a descendant, actual descendant of the Pacific Grove Chinese Village. He's an author of several books and articles on race and religion. He is the co-founder of the Stop AAPI 8, which was awarded the 2021 uh, VD Award for Social Movement of the Year. The topic of Dr. Jones' presentation tonight will be Stop AAPI, the Point Alone Fishing Village and Intergenerational Trauma. So please welcome Dr. Russell Jones. Site where people could report um, the racism that they were experiencing. And we launched in March 2020, and immediately we were inundated with hundreds of incidents across the nation of anti Asian hate. And the vitriol was just palpable. I was shocked um, to see how much anger and fear was being directed towards Asians. So, to give you a sense of what's happening, that is continuing to be happening. Um, I'm going to invite Roy to read um, some of them. So, next slide. So, as we hear these incidents, I want you to put yourselves in the, these person's shoes, and later I'm going to ask you to um, share a few of your feelings. And so, this may be triggering. Customer began screaming at me for no reason while in line and correctly distanced in six feet. 
I am mostly Chinese, and my family has been in San Luis Obispo since the 1860s. I am fourth generation in San Luis Obispo, but I guess I will never be an American. Waiting across the street, I felt something on my head, and it turned out to be spit all over my head, the back of my coat. I was repeatedly spit on by a big white guy. I was standing in an aisle when suddenly I was struck from behind. Video surveillance verifying the incident in which a white male using his bent elbow striking my upper back. Subsequent verbal attacks occurred with shut up you monkey F expectative. Um, you Chinamen go back to China, bringing that Chinese virus over here. On my daily walk in my hometown of Sausalito, wearing a face mask, a white woman yelled at me, I hate Chinese people. Why do they come to this country? When she passed me, I was stunned by her words and caused me to fear of being more alert to my surroundings. My husband and I were taking a walk, minding our own business, when two dogs tried to attack us. When the woman owner came to us, she said, the reason the dogs are afraid of you is because you eat dogs then said, you need to go back from where you came from. We were shocked to hear this. Waiting to enter a pharmacy to get my prescription, a group of construction workers not doing social distancing made fun of me, picking coffee, spitting, and they slant eyes. No one else called this person out. That's in my town of Brooklyn. I was shopping and a child grabbed my arm. Child said, I should go back to my country and I was the reason that his father died. Mother came up and put her hand on my arm, but she didn't try to help me. Bakersfield occasionally has ignorant people who make fun of how I talk and look and tell me to go home. But this is the scariest and saddest experience I've had in U.S. since about 1977. As I was leaving the restaurant, white male stormed up to me and verbally harassed and terrorized me, screaming, return to China in epic Asian and other hateful racial slurs threatening me physically. A clear case of racial hatred towards me. I gave a verbal account to officers who were my I have not heard back from anyone. Okay, thanks. So, what do you feel when you hear these statements? If you were in their shoes, so a few words, we chat it out. Anger, sad, fear, fear, uh, racism, racism is messed up. Yeah, messed up. A few others. Anxiety. Anxiety. Or. Or. Thanks. So those feelings of anger, fear, messed up, or sadness. I think are what the Asian American community are experiencing overall right now. This is a period of collective racial trauma. Um, because if you are directly attacked, you're gonna have those feelings. And one out of five of us now have symptoms of racial trauma. That's three or more of these feelings. They're long-term feelings of anxiety, of depression, of anger, of being hyper-vigilant, always looking out for you, or of waiting for you. So this is a period that's traumatic. It's collective because one out of five AAPIs have now experienced what's going on. And those of us who haven't directly experienced it, we experience it vicariously. So if you see an elder or a grandmother attacked, you can't help but think, oh, that could have been my grandmother, that could have been my mom. So it's collective in that way. And we know it's racial because people aren't attacking us because they know us as individuals. It's simply because of how we look we're getting attacked. So it's collective racial trauma that's gonna have long-term impacts. I'm saying it's a period like Japanese American incarceration, and the impacts will be intergenerational, as I'll share it later on. So, if we go back. <clears throat> so, I want to talk about um, what I've been experiencing and learning Organizing Stop API Hate. Not only um, the own pain, my own pain, and the trauma that 
I've been exhibiting, sadly, but also um, how I'm seeking healing as an individual, but also how I want to make institutional change. And I think Asian Americans at this moment, um, beyond even healing, are also poised to actually really bring um, change to this nation, and I'd like to explain why. So my, my reflection is called Be Like Water, and it's actually the Dallas reflection on how Asian Americans can contribute to the fight for racial justice. And this stems from um, a cognitive therapy approach by Doris Chang of NYU. She's been developing an indigenous um, Chinese therapy practice, and I'm expanding that notion of uh, Dallas psychology to developing this Taoist approach towards racial justice. So we need to be like water, and water has four qualities that I really want to highlight. Water is clear, water is humble, water is pers persistent, and water is restorative. Next slide. So the first quality of water that I think is really needed in the moment is, is water's clarity. We need to be clear on what's happening. We need to understand um, the roots of racism, and you know water does sink to the roots. And water, um, that is clear, helps us become more mindful of what's happening. So we who are individually traumatized need to be mindful, but we also need to be clear on the impacts of what's happening to persons to address it well. So you, you heard what we're experiencing, but let me give you the big picture. Next slide. Again, we perceive I don't know if you could read it. We perceived um, 11,000 incidents to date. Again, that's just the tip of the iceberg. But there, what's happening aren't all hate crimes. And that's where our data shows us that we're experiencing the range of racism. And they fall under four main categories. Um, the four bottom categories are civil rights violations. We're getting mistreated at the workplace. We're getting denied service. We're getting barred from ride share. Um, if you see in the middle, online harassment makes up about 9% of the cases, and young people who are on their screens a lot experience this probably regularly. Um, our youth did a study and they found that 70% of their peers saw something racist or stereotypic online within the last month. So they experience the racism indirectly online. On the top is um, harassment and shunning. That makes the bulk of the incidents, two-thirds of the cases are verbal harassment. But they're not microaggressions in the fact that they're micro or small in impact. As you've heard, they've been really horrific. People are, you know, hurling profanities at us, racial epithets. So it's, um, a lot of times when you hear those things, most Asians actually, um, you know, you go into fight or flight mode because you're threatened. Most Asians freeze, because you don't really expect a neighbor to come up and just yell such wild things to you. And the final category is physical assault, and they can be considered hate crimes, but it's really difficult to prosecute a hate crime. And we're getting coughed and spat upon in such high rates that I actually created a special checkoff category, you know, so that people could easily answer. So my own wife was running in Oakland, and someone just blocked her path and coughed into her face. Um, physical assault makes up one of about six of our cases. So we see um, people throw bottles and rocks at us, people you know, push and shove us, people try to run us over with their cars. And I saw so much violence, I saw so much anger, that sadly I wasn't surprised when we saw elders killed in Oakland and in San Francisco last year. Um, I saw so much violence that sadly I wasn't surprised by the Atlanta shootings. We actually tried to prepare for such eventuality. So, um, reading all these reports, you get a sense again of the extent of um, racism and xenophobia. And the trends have been really consistent. Um, you can see 57% of the response are non Chinese. Um, even though people are blaming China for COVID-19, over half of the people are non-Chinese, mostly people who love Chinese, so Vietnamese, Koreans, um, Filipinos. But a Latino person in Los Angeles was punched and told to go back to China. 
an indigenous person in Vancouver was attacked and told to go back to China. So again, it just depends on how you look, and if you look Asian, you can be profiled. Finally, bullies attack those who they think they can bully, so women get harassed twice as much as men, and youth um, and mothers are often disproportionately targeted. Okay, next slide. The impacts have been deadly, they've been um, violent, and again, they've been traumatizing. As I said, one out of five Asian Americans who experience this racism now um, face racial trauma. That's almost a million cases of trauma. We pulled our respondents and asked them, what's your greatest stressor during the pandemic? And overwhelmingly, Asian Americans who experience racism say their greatest stressor is more racism. So think about that. More than a pandemic that's killed a million people, Asian Americans are fearful of other Americans. Right? We're more afraid of a stranger than this hyper-contagious disease. That's because you can wear a mask, you can get vaccinated against, um, against COVID-19, but you can't vaccinate yourself from the racism that we're experiencing. Next slide. Because of racism, um, our Asian American economy has been hard hit. People were avoiding our businesses even before the quarantine, so they were avoiding Chinese restaurants, Vietnamese nail salon. Those businesses then had to close, and large portions of the Asian working class have been laid off. Asian Americans have the second highest rate of unemployment currently. And look at the stat. 83% of Asian Americans with a high school degree or less are unemployed. That's two and a half times more than the uh, um, average Californian with the same background. So again, not only are we unemployed because of the pandemic, we're unemployed because of racism. And next slide. And as I said, we were concerned that history would repeat itself, that we would face racist violence, and racist policies, and sure enough, that's what happened during the last two years. Uh, President Trump first banned Chinese scientists and researchers, he extended the Muslim ban, and then he suspended migration visas altogether so that families didn't reunite. He continued and, banned, and cut refugee resettlement, he cut H-1B visas. All these policies disproportionately hurt Asians and viewed us as a yellow peril, as threats the nation's public health or the national security. So it was the second Chinese exclusion now. So we need to be clear, the racism has been extensive, the racism has had broad major impacts. The racism has been institutionalized. Okay, next slide. So knowing that the racism is institutionalized, I think we need to be humble like water as well. And I like this quality. Uh, water is humble in that it doesn't try to fight back and go through the rock, but instead it's yielding and goes with the flow. And so my concern, um, as Asians experience racism, that we learn to become racist ourselves. We can easily become anti-white, we can become anti-black. You know that hurt people hurt people, right? And so. If Asians are getting attacked and hurt, we then take out that anger, we take out that trauma on others as well. And I see that even in myself, that in this stressful time, I think I'm really um, on edge and have taken out my anger on those closest to me. And so we have to be humble. We have to recognize that we're traumatized, but then we just take out that trauma on others. And we then perpetuate America's racist cycle of violence. And unless we become humble, unless we recognize that we as Asians, that I too am susceptible to racism, we're just going to continue. And so we need to be humble like water to deal with it. And one of the ways I think we're, we need to address racism is to not to blame individuals for their prejudiced attitudes. We have to recognize we all have endless devices, and instead of wanting to punish and incarcerate individuals, what we need to do is change the institutions, change the structures 
that socialize us to become racist, that socialize, socialize us and make us uh, feel like we have a license to cough or spit on another. So let me tell you how I see the institutional sources of the racism. Next slide. First of all, people are afraid of the pandemic, that's clear, but our politics and our politicians really exacerbated the problem. The insistence on the term Chinese virus really was deadly for us because it did two things. It took the virus that was simply biological and made it Chinese. And it made Chinese people stigmatized. We were seen as the disease carriers. So that association with the virus is Chinese and Chinese people are the disease carriers really became deadly and became part of people's implicit bias, uh, people's racial schema. So if you learn neuroscience, people do that's the way our brain operates. We have schema, we have ways of perceiving the world that lead to automatic responses. It's as if, if you see a dog growling at you, you don't stop and think its teeth, it's bare, it's growling, it looks scary. You automatically run away from the scary dog. That's how our brain processes information. It's with our schema. In the same way as we keep on hearing the association that the disease is Chinese and Chinese people have the disease, that becomes part of our implicit bias and we automatically react to people. We automatically um, get triggered by Asians. And I see that happening again and again. Next slide. Media representations is another institutional force that reinforced that association that Chinese have the disease and the disease is Chinese. So early on, COVID-19 was represented time and time again with Chinese people wearing masks. And this is actually an Instagram post of a, a party. Um, students had a coronavirus party. So they drank corona beer. And they had pictures of Chinese people with masks on all around them. And some of the pictures had the Chinese with their eyes next out as if they had died. And this is how students are partying. So again, when you see Thousands of representations of Chinese people wearing masks to represent COVID, that actually chemically hardwires in our brain that the disease is Chinese and Chinese people have that disease. So even I have that implicit bias. Early in the pandemic, if I saw an Asian person wearing a mask and I saw a non-Asian not wearing a mask, I would automatically think, oh, that person, the Chinese person is more likely to be diseased, right? I would shun the, the Asian with a mask and go towards the non-Asian without a mask, even though I'd probably be more likely to catch the disease from the unmasked person. So you get it. I'm not saying everybody's intentionally racist, but I'm saying we all have implicit biases, we all use racial schema, we all racially profile other people. That's just how our system socializes us. Okay, next slide. And finally, the third sort of structural reason why um, I see a surge of racism are politicians are invoking historic stereotypes. Um, and the main one I see being invoked is the fear of Asians as the yellow peril. And this is a long-standing stereotype that Asians are a threat to the West, that they'll come from the East with their hordes of people, with their disease or divides, and overcome the West. Um, politicians use the yellow arrow because it works, right? It works to their benefit. And you see politicians today making China the existential threat to America. And it organizes their base. And knowing it worked in the past, they'll use it again today. And so again, racism isn't just a bunch of individual prejudiced people. Racism is created and used by politicians because it works. So let me show you a couple of incidents of how this yellow peril stereotype has been invoked. Here you can see three diseases, malaria, smallpox, and leprosy, um, seem to be specters of death emanating out of San Francisco Chinatown. This fear, again, of Chinese being disease carriers, plus the stereotype that Asians stole white workers' jobs, plus the stereotype that were heathen, unassimilable pagans, those stereotypes were used um, 
to invoke the Yellow Peril, and that's why the U.S. passed the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882. Um, at the same time, though, that racist policy, the first legislation to bar entire ethnic group, it didn't quell the violence, but rather 200 cases in California occurred right after the Exclusion Act in the mid-1880s. 200 cases of Chinese settlements being dispossessed, mass displaced by mob violence, and then it occurred here at Pacific Grove, um, to my town. So next slide. So these are my great grandparents. My great grandmother, Hong Kong Tai, came in 1860 with her parents and her brother and sister. So they were unusual in that the whole family came and she settled here in the 1860s. My great grandfather, John Kwong Chung, came in 1882. So if you look at the census maps from 1900, you can see their names. And they must have been Jerry's and Shelley's grandmother. They probably grew up together, my great grandmother. They lived here for four decades, built a thriving business, raised a family, until, again, the point. Pacific Grove townspeople wanted them out. They didn't like the smell, the squid drying. They wanted to expand for um, gentrification. And so they wrote to Stanford and the Pacific Improvement um, Land Company who leased the land. Um, Stanford then evicted the Chinese, sent them eviction orders, and this is in Sandy Lydon's book, but the Chinese wouldn't leave. So here at Pacific Grove, um, the they sent a telegram from San Francisco to here and said, get rid of the Chinese by any means necessary. And then the next week, a fire burned down the entire fishing village. And newspapers reported that the next day, people were cheering the looting of the village. People were cheering the burning of the village. Um, reports were that Stanford then fenced, uh, they bulldozed the, the village into the Pacific, they put in a fence and armed guards so that the Chinese couldn't return. So my great grandparents, again, see all their possessions, all their life's work burned down. They moved to Macabee Beach, right, where a lot of Chinese moved. And eventually they had to go to San Francisco, Chinatown, as the only place of refuge. And that was sort of the first trauma that my um, family experienced. Uh, next slide. Um, another case of the Yellow Pearl being invoked is the bubonic plague in 1900. It was found in San Francisco Chinatown. So health officials segregated the area, they quarantined Chinatown, they allowed whites to leave and left, kept Chinese inside Chinatown, presumably to get sick, kept them in there with ropes, barbed wire, and again, on guards. Um, the Chinatowns of Santa Ana and Honolulu were completely burned down in the 80,000s. So again, you see how the Chronicle has a headline, the bubonic plague that's eerie parallels to modern day. Disease come, Chinese get blamed, Chinese face violence, Chinese face racist health policies. All right, next slide. This continued on Angel Island, that connection of health, racialized bodies, the yellow peril, fear, and racist policies. Because Chinese were seen as illegal, because Chinese were seen as disease carrying, they were mass detained on Angel Island. If Europeans were coming through Ellis Island, they were processed in two to three hours and allowed to disembark. Chinese, on the other hand, were mass detained and get interrogated um, for, on average, two weeks. Right, next slide. <clears throat> so this is my grandfather, um, Wai Fong Zhang, who was born at that point in 1903. Even though he was an American-born citizen, when he went to go get his wife from Hong Kong, my grandmother, Hong and Chen, they didn't believe him that he was an American citizen. They didn't believe his parents that he was an American citizen. So the INS records um, show that he had to get three white witnesses from Monterey to go to Angel Island to testify on his behalf. They'll believe the white testimony and so, even though he brought in the white testimony, um, they still had to go through that grueling interrogation process um, that many of you have heard about. 
Um, our records show that they asked them 56 questions, but they had to answer correctly, and both of their answers had to align, or else they would have kicked out my grandmother. My grandmother had to strip naked before Western medical doctors, a real shameful process for Chinese women at the time, and so my poor grandfather had to, you know, wait for weeks to see if he could eventually bring his bride to the United States. 5% of the Chinese who spent their family fortunes to come to America, um, make that three-week village, never made it to San Francisco, but were deported back for health reasons. They were really arbitrary health reasons, like having hookworms. But again, another experience of race policy and trauma intersecting with my family. Next slide. Later on, tuberculosis became an epidemic in California, and the Latinx community and the Asian community um, had higher rates of TB. And actually, both sides of my family, my father's side and my mother's side, got TB. And it's not because we're genetically predisposed to it, it's because of environmental racism. Because we were segregated and had to live in more crowded, squalid conditions, Latinos and Chinese were more likely to get TB. My grandfather died of TB. Um, and the health policy then was that they had to be quarantined to county hospitals. Next slide. So here you can see my mom's side. Um, that's my grandmother's Susie Shu and my mom's the eldest. Again, my grandfather died of TB and then my grandmother got TB. And so she was sent to the county hospital. My mom and her three siblings then were, were what? What happens to kids when they have no parents? Yeah, they're, they're foster kids, and um, they were to be sent to a foster home. But my, this is the, the secret family, our family secret. They lied and said that they had Chinese relatives taking care of them. And so for six months, they lived on their own with my mom at 15, taking care of her younger siblings, paying rent, going to school, and collecting county welfare. So my mom was a teenage welfare queen. When the social workers came, they brought the Chinese relatives around the block and said, and pretended to be fictive. Well, they were, well, they were fictive in acting as real people. But eventually, my mom got tuberculosis too, and so social workers came to inspect the house, and they said, wait a minute, there are no adults living here. So again, the family was separated. My mom went to the county hospital, and because of segregation, my aunts and uncles couldn't go to a Chinese orphanage like they had up here in the Bay Area. Um, and they couldn't be sent to a white orphanage because they weren't white, so they ended up going to a Spanish-American Mexican orphanage. So my aunts and uncles grew up speaking Spanish um, because of this weird racial policy. So you can see, because of the yellow peril threat, and because of the way policies get implemented, and because of race, my own family experienced um, exclusion, mass displacement, segregation, quarantine, mass detention, and long-term family separation simply because they're Chinese. And that, all those experiences, I think, have really impacted my family because um, I think they really wanted to take care of their kids. They migrated to take care of their family. But time and time again, they would build a home and it would burn down. They would bring home a bride, but they couldn't take care of her. They would <clears throat> get sick and then be separated. And so I think in instances where we want to take care of our family and you are unable to, um, it just leads to a lot of anger and frustration that I think get passed down to my family. Okay, next slide. I'll skip this. Okay, so we have to be clear like water and understand what's happening, get to the roots of what's happening. We have to be humble, recognizing that as we're experiencing racism, we can become racist ourselves. And then instead of blaming other individuals, we need to address the systemic roots of it. 
Water, even though it's yielding, even though water goes with the flow, water is persistent and therefore powerful. And drops of water can break through rock. And that's what I see the community doing now, is that we're being persistent in trying to make change, in trying to make institutional change. And with our persistence, we are making change. Next slide. And next slide. I see our youth making change. Um, we called for a youth campaign, and within a week we gathered 100 youth from across the nation. These youth wanted to fight racism. They created their own policy report, and it became the basis of Congresswoman Grace Meng's ethnic studies bill. Um, these youth organized a 1,200-person rally in Berkeley. They're middle schoolers, and they're calling for ethnic studies, too. And so their persistence I think that's really made an impact on the movement. Next slide. Our social influences are making an impact with their persistence. Early on, government didn't pay attention to us. Early on, we didn't get any mainstream media attention. But because they were persistent in messaging what's happening, sounding the alarm, and eventually, President Biden issued an executive order. Eventually, mainstream media is paying attention to us. Okay, next slide. And the community overall has really created a mass movement for change and has been persistent the last two years. Um, I talked about how we're going into fight or flight response, that other people are going to fight or flight response because we're triggering them and scaring them about COVID-19. Well, Asians now are also being threatened and we're getting triggered by racism. And so we're going into fight response. And you see Asians arming themselves. You see Asians buying mace. We're going into flight response. We're telling our elders to stay indoors. We're the racial group least likely to want to go back to work or go back to school. So we're going to fight for flight, but there's a third response that I think is really effective, and, and that is beyond fight or flight in the face of danger of racism, we're flocking. So think about that. I think it's a, 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 a great metaphor of how we're responding. We're flocking back at these vigils to grieve and um, find solace in one another. We're flocking back at these rallies in Chinatown to find strength with each other, to gain allies. We're flocking back to Chinatown to support depressed businesses. We're flocking back to support and chaperone our elders. We're flocking here tonight, um, calling on the Pacific um, Grove to make an apology and to make change. So by flocking persistently, I think we are making change. Now, let me show you a couple of ways how. Next slide. We have to be clear like water, we have to be humble like water, we need to be persistent like water, and eventually we can be like water that's restored. And over spring break, um, my family, we visited Manzanar, um, the Japanese American concentration camp. And as you can see in the picture, it's a desolate, arid place right next to the Death Valley, the last place on Earth. But when Japanese Americans were there, they restored Manzanar, the camp, and actually planted amazing gardens with the little water they had. And they were able to restore a prison site to make it a place of beauty and life. And in the same way, I think, if we can be like water, we can actually restore America in the face of its polarization, in the face of its racism, in the face of its equity. And let me tell you how we at South Bay, I hate are looking um, to help restore America by working across race. Next slide. We are going to promote three major initiatives, and the first is educational equity. The majority of Americans say the way to address racism is through education, that we have to unlearn racism even as children, so we're really promoting ethnic studies. And actually, this Asian American studies movement has really been picking up. California passed an ethnic studies requirement in the K through 12 um, school system. Um, Illinois and New Jersey just passed requirements to do it, and 10 other states are also proposing Asian American studies. So this is a great opportunity for us, again, to work with other communities of color to teach their histories, their narratives, and so we're working along others to push for ethnic studies. This is in the face of the anti-critical race theory movement. 
where 38 states are proposing to not teach race. So we're sort of butting up against that broad movement too, and um, you can support our efforts by um, promoting ethnic studies. We're going to host a national summit in June for all the people organizing for Asian American studies. Next slide. Another thing we're doing is um, trying to expand civil rights. Like I said, two-thirds of the incidents are cases of street harassment. And I know that um, my daughters, when they took the bus in Oakland, they would get cat calls, so they didn't want to take the bus to school. My wife, when she takes part, is really hyper-vigilant and stands back away from the platform, right? Because she's afraid she'll get pushed. My mom is 95 years old. I asked her after the killings of the elderly, she used to walk everywhere in San Francisco. I asked her, where would you go? And she said, I'd only walk on Clement Street, the Chinese area. That's de facto segregation. My mom is now relegated to just one neighborhood in San Francisco, even though she used to go everywhere. That's the norm for Asian American women now, this hypervigilance, this avoidance of places, this constant fear, and that shouldn't be the norm. So our policy is actually to call, um, to make racism a public health issue. Again, rather than trying to punish perpetrators, we're calling on the public health department to define street harassment, to show how it harms everybody, and to do public education campaigns so that men will treat women better in public. It shouldn't be the norm that women fear where to go. And again, this is a, a policy that we are, that's sponsored by the API Legislative Caucus, but also by Mia Bonta and Assemblywoman Weber, a black um, assemblywoman from LA and a black Latina assemblywoman from Oakland. Because again, this issue cuts across race, and we can build solidarity, and we can restore safety for women and other women workers by working together. Next slide. And finally, we're again pushing for community safety in ways that don't involve more policing, that don't involve more mass incarceration. In California, we actually passed $156 million for um, an API equity budget, and that funding goes to provide more resources for the victims, culturally responsive resources, so that they, that they can get medical care or trauma-informed care. Because we passed it in California, New York, and Massachusetts is also proposing it. And again, these funds aren't just to help Asians, but it's to work on any community dealing with racism. All right, next slide. So thank you for flogging with me tonight. Thank you for joining the descendants of the Monterey fishing village. Um, our hope is that we can become like water to remember how our ancestors fished here on the water. Um, and if we can be like water, then we can hopefully restore our nation and once it belong to a community here. Thank you very much. Asians haven't faced discrimination 
at, the, uh, at Harvard. It's a contentious issue, but rather than us fighting to get into places like Harvard or even UC, the majority of Asian Americans go to community college. Three times as many Asian Americans and Chinese Americans go to community college rather than going to UC. 200, no, 2,000 times more Asians go to community college to get into Harvard. So I think our educational policies, if we want to promote equity, would focus on expanding education opportunities for everybody, especially at the places where Asians go, like community college, like CSU Monterey Bay, and so like the real college. And so um, I think this fight over affirmative action actually is misplaced, and if Asian Americans really care about education and care about the the community as a whole. We should be trying to improve all schools, not just trying to get into one or two. So um, that might be contentious, but I just want to. Thanks. Another question? Comment? Yes.
Yeah. So um, Gene said that in California we passed an ethnic studies of requirement. It doesn't have to be fully implemented by until 2029. And we have some funding to implement it. Um, but the anti-CRT movement also is operating in California. That's anti-critical race theory, where people don't want the teaching of race and other topics that are possibly divisive or um, offensive. And so, um, again, I just met with the California Teachers Association um, officials, and they said some California faculty have been getting death threats for teaching about ethnic studies. There's a book called um, Dragon Wings by Lord Xiep. It's about um, Chinese in the turn of the century. That got banned. In fact, this talk that I just gave, it was, I would give it to um, federal employee groups, but because of Trump's executive order, this talk was banned too, and I had to cancel a couple of presentations. So even this story of my family's history is getting banned. And so, um, so memorialize it because maybe we won't be able to talk about this.
generation after generation. And it's, you know, it's, you know, getting back to the apology, um, it's not, you know, obviously it doesn't do away with what was done, but it's a start. And I think that the um, descendants of the village, you know, can come back to Pacific Grove and, and finally understand or come to appreciate the fact that the community in Pacific Grove, you know, finally has recognized the errors and has apologized for that. Um, and hopefully it's a, it's a promise that, you know, maybe this is not going to happen again, or it won't be tolerated and it won't happen again. You know, maybe I'm naive to think that's going to happen, but at least it's a start. Yeah, so actually um, Stanford University um, is doing a study on point, actually the weird thing is, they're studying the Point Alonis village and they actually have a, a fish archaeologist studying the bones of the fish caught here and how far the fish caught by the Chinese spread throughout the Chinese communities in the West. Because they could figure out, you know, bones in Utah and see if they're similar to the bones here. Um, and so they had extra money and so Stanford then asked some of the descendants, what else would you want to ask about? And so actually I wanted to ask, and so the descendants here, what happened to your families after the fire? And so again, my family, it took us two generations to become homeowners again. So, you know, that economic impact of mass dispossession, what was that? And I, you know, so I'd like to work with Stanford to, if I ever had time, I'm going to stop you, I need stuff. This is to go to the descent and just ask your family, what was the loss um, from, you know, the fire? Where, where did your families move to? What kind of occupations did they take then? And that, that, that story of mass displacement um, is relevant because California now has a reparations commission. It's looking to provide reparations to African Americans. Um, you know, the country provided reparations to Japanese Americans, but we've never known what happened to the 200 Chinese communities that were just erased. And so we could be the start of an understanding of what was the impact of mass displacement. Um, and then that would help future it's happening, you know, it's happening now with gentrification of communities getting displaced. But it helped us give us an understanding of what are the impacts of displacement. Okay, any other questions or comments? Oh, okay, question. Uh, actually, a comment. comment. The apology will be written at uh, Red, Red City Council meeting <coughs> on May 11th. It's at 6 o'clock in the middle of the city of Pacific Road. You'll find a way to jump on Zoom or you can go in person. And I would just like to invite everybody to uh, attend that meeting. And there will be a time for public comment. And, we'll be, and I think a lot of your stories should be told that night. I think it's really important that people understand why this is happening, why we're going through this. trying to heal the community. And I think everybody that's, that's has a descendant from that, uh, that village, I think it's important that the city hears your story and uh, understands why, why this apology is important. Thank you. I was actually just going to say that, that uh, we are hoping that the apology will be approved by the Pacific Grove City Council in time for it to be read at the Walk of Remembrance. But there's, you know, it's not a guarantee. I'm sure there are people out there that are looking at this apology and wondering why, you know, why now uh, and why us. Um, so any support that you can give, um, you know, us in terms of uh, attending the uh, City Council meeting, writing letters, or contacting the City Council will be greatly appreciated. Um, comment? I wanted to ask so that the apology is an important first step, um, but what, how do we as a community heal? Because the apology is not going to be the end of the process. And it seems like there's a lot of emphasis, and I, I have worry that the apology will happen and that there won't be much else that happens in the community around healing. So I just want to know 
you know, what, what Professor Jang's perspective is on how do we, how do we as a community really pursue healing and reconciliation for the long term? Well, if you ever have um, a fight with your family members, not only do you need to apologize and to acknowledge your wrong, but you have to repair the relationship. And that's why the idea of reparations is really powerful. It's showing real contrition that you're going to make an effort to repair the relationship rather than just apologize for what you've done wrong. That's the whole notion of restorative justice. We want to restore the relationships. We want to bring real peace. So I don't know what reparations would look like here. Maybe it's more educational efforts. Maybe it's um, um, you know what the museum is doing to commemorate and to recognize and to acknowledge is really important. Um, I want Stanford University to do something. Um, yeah, so um, so I think um, you know the calls for African Americans reparations. The call for um, makes sense and not only acknowledging what we've done wrong, but making an effort to get it to, to heal. Um, so I think we do need to be like water. And, you know, for us going through individual trauma, um, just individual healing isn't enough because we face racism again and again. So all we're learning to do is to cope in the light of a system that continues to traumatize us. So what we need to do again is for healing is to change the systems and work together to change the systems that, that harm us. Yeah, I, personally, I, I think education is key. I, you know, I, I don't know what the uh, education system is in, in Pacific Grove, but I doubt that there's any discussion about the Chinese community and what happened here. Um, there needs to be that discussion. Um, there needs to be, you know, the healing of the community, and I think the only way you do that is to gather people to talk about our collective, you know, experience in history. We all have experienced some kind of, you know, discrimination or, or hate crime or whatever. And the only way to keep moving forward from that is to learn from each other, understand where we're coming from, you know, appreciate our cultures and, and understand each other's culture and history. And, and not just pigeonhole people, you know, and try to understand each other as, as individuals. Uh, it's gonna be a long, gonna be a long process and you can't force people to, to, to try to change. And uh, it's one of the things my, uh, you know, my wife tried to do for 10 years. And it, it, you know, it's too bad that she's not here to see that this is the start. You know, it's obviously not the end, it's just the start. And this is where the hard work begins. But people also have to be open to a discussion about our differences and, and how, how we can learn from each other. And I think that's that's the hard part, is, is trying to get people to come together and, and talk to each other. Um, any other? Mullen? Hi. Um, I'm Bowen Lee, and um, I'm one of the descendants of the uh, fishing village at Marceloni. And I wanted to address what you said, because the Pacific Road History Museum has, um, Natural History Museum has, um, has allowed me to give a storytelling session for families. And it is everything that they are talking about. You're going to learn so much about the history of not only the Chinese people, but <coughs> other people who have lived here in Pacific Road and the cultural contributions that they have made that have been quite significant for this era. So, um, the city of Pacific Grove um, has said that inclusion, diversity, and, um, and uh, cultural respect is so very important. And so that's what this event is. It'll be before the Walk of Remembrance at 11 o'clock in the garden at the Pacific Grove Museum. So please come and invite the whole family. Thank you.
uh, by Sandy Lydon, the uh, author of the uh, book Chinese Bill. He's the uh, authoritative uh, you know, historian on, on Chinese history in uh, Monterey. So that's going to happen Friday the 13th. Uh, as Bill had said, she's doing a storytelling uh, project uh, Saturday at uh, 11 o'clock, just before we do the Walk of Remembrance. So um, if people could attend that, that would be great. And obviously after that is the Walk of Remembrance that starts uh, probably at 1 and again. We're hoping that the City Council will approve the resolution and it can be read to the community. Um, if you haven't uh, registered um, for this particular event, we'd like to get your email so that we can send you information. Um, so if you haven't registered for this event, RSVP, if you could see uh, me, I guess, at the end, and I'll just get your name and your address, and, and we'll make sure that you get um, you know, additional information as we go on. Yes, Yeah, I think it is in this, 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 this particular building. Okay, any other comments, questions? Will it be posted online? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, I, I'm sorry about that. I believe it will be posted. Yeah. Yes. Jerry, they're right in the in front and center. All right, thank you. It's actually done by a consultant that was hired by the BG Museum. So, uh, last question or comment? If none, thank you very much for your attendance and thank you. Very much.